But I just think it's vital to do to to to, to be orthodox and upright and that the sometimes the kindest thing we can do for those entrusted to our charge is is to leave some people would think i was wrong about that but i think sometimes that may be because then they say oh this really does matter yeah. oh this is really serious i tend to be a bit depressive and i sort of think oh this is awful and i've often reminded myself that on the last day the lord jesus will raise up every man woman and child the father has given him and nothing's going to change that Well, welcome to our uh, Tron Talking Points podcast. A little bit unusual uh, this time because uh, we're not doing the normal weekly podcast, but we're taking advantage of the fact that we are in the middle of our expository ministry conference. And I'm sitting down with uh, an old friend and colleague, Christopher Ash, who is uh, up as one of our speakers. And Christopher, it's lovely to have you with us again. Um, I couldn't believe it was quite so long since you were here. I thought it was just three or four years, but I think it was 2016. I think it was. Yeah. It's really good to be back. Well, it's lovely to have Carolyn you. Carolyn and I are loving being back with you all. Well, it's great to have you and uh, we're, we're very grateful indeed. Now, um, many folk listening to this podcast, I think, will know you through your books because we have all your books on our bookstall and we promote them uh, uh, regularly and lots of folk will have read them. But maybe beyond that, for our folks here... Most wouldn't have met you perhaps in any other context. So maybe we could just start with telling us who you are, where you came from and what sure. you do. Very happily, yes. I came to faith in Christ when I was 17 at school and uh, will always be grateful for those who brought me the gospel. Mm. Uh, I was an engineer at university in Cambridge. I didn't um, know that, gosh. Yes, yes. Amazing, really, isn't it? I was good at exams and a terrible engineer, so that didn't last long. And then I taught maths for 12 years. Well, I, knew, I knew you taught maths. Yeah, I taught maths for eight years in Dorset, during which time I married Carolyn, and we had our first two children. Then we moved to Edinburgh. I was head of maths at a school in Edinburgh, and uh, then our third child was born in the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. Is that right? And uh, then we moved down to Oxford. I trained for ordained ministry and our daughter was born. And uh, then I was an assistant minister at St Andrew the Great Church in Cambridge mm -hmm. um, and then led the first of what's now four church plants from there. Right. Um, and that was in to, Little Shelford. Yes, in, yes, near, little, near Cambridge. little village yeah. just outside Cambridge. Yeah. And I think that's when I first got to know you, when I was working at the Proclamation Trust. Oh, yes, and I probably came to conferences. Yeah, yeah. But then, just as I left and moved back to Glasgow, in fact, you quite literally moved into the house we've been living in it because in 2004 you came to follow David Jackman and be the director of Cornhill in London. I did. It was a great surprise when David asked me to do that. And um, a great joy. It was a sadness to leave pastoral ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've missed it from the day I finished because mm. that's the best job in the world. But Cornhill was was such a privilege. But it was always the problem with Cornhill that the person that we needed to come and do it was the person who didn't want to come because they yes. wanted to be in pastoral ministry, yes. which is why exactly. we needed that kind of person. Yeah. And then remind me, how, so how long then... Were you at Cornhill in London? I was at Cornhill from 2004 to 2015, so 11 years. I'd hoped to do more, but in 2012, I had what you'd probably call a nervous breakdown, something like that. I had a, a difficult time. And I didn't really... I recovered enough to teach and you know do my duties, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really recovered. So in 2015, I... I um, stood down it's some years earlier than I'd intended to actually mm -hmm. but um, but you kind of moved sideways because you didn't you didn't retire no you you, you yeah. continued and, you, and you're now just tell me the official they call me writer in residence, writer in residence. at Tyndale House in Cambridge does that not sound grand it sounds very grand it sounds <laughs> it's a great job I have no duties but <laughs> But the main the main point for uh, people like us is that you are writing and still writing. Yes, and you've yes. You've been producing a lot of books, uh, haven't you? And just finished a real 
I suppose it is perhaps your magnum opus, a big four-volume commentary on the Psalms. Yeah, it's, is- it's a monster, really. It's a four-volume commentary on the Psalms, and it focuses on being Christ centered really trying to reconnect with the first three quarters or more of Christian history in which Mm -hmm. Christ was pretty central really when reading the Psalms. So you've got that under your belt and um, taking a bit of a breather. Yes. yes. But you're going to continue. Yeah, God willing. Yes, God willing. I'm trying to write a little pastoral book for the Good Book Company on being a Christian in your 50s, 60s and maybe early 70s, which I want to call the afternoon of life, as opposed to the evening. Yes, as I get closer and closer to my 60s, I kind of feel that it's the beginning of middle age rather than old age. But Quite, uh, quite right. Yes, well, I <laughs> turn... My, my body doesn't always quite agree I with I turned me, 70 at the end of next uh, last year and... Um, you're almost in you're almost in sort of mid-middle age now then. I like to think it's, to, it's still the afternoon, <laughs> although there are days when it feels more like the evening. Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> But um, so it's been great having you here and you've done um, a couple now, one more exposition to come. And we've been looking at the book of Lamentations, um, which is probably not top of the list of what most people would sort of expect to have at a Christian conference, but very necessary. Um, And you've been doing a bit of teaching on that in in, in various places. What, What... what got you into Lamentations at this time? Well, it's partly that I'd finished the Psalms and I wanted something shorter, but yes. it's also, I think, a sense that it's a little-known mm. book, these five sad poems, and that it's somehow it's timely and it's neglected and we need to learn how to be sorrowful well. Mm-hmm. So I've, But I've, I'm learning all the time from it. It's a difficult book. It's a mm. painful book. But I feel in God's grace I'm... Making some progress. Well, as as uh, many who are listening will know, um, you know, as a church, we are in a time of sadness and yeah. and uh, a, a, and grief at the moment with mm. with our um, staff member Phil being mm. being so very ill, and it does suddenly mm. um, it makes people realise. Well, how do we how do we express ourselves to the yes. Lord when you know stand up and be happy and sing isn't. No. isn't appropriate or it's certainly no. not how you what you feel able to do and i mean so many of the psalms are yes. lament well that's it and it it's in in so many churches where we we never sing psalms in any form mm-hmm. it's very hard for musicians to find suitable songs to sing mm-hmm. but but as you rightly say the psalms have plenty mm-hmm. one of the things that um uh, you've mentioned in terms of uh, Lamentations, but also Nick Tucker, one of the other speakers, mm. brought up this afternoon, this morning, was talking about having to talk about some of the very challenging doctrines mm. and issues that come out mm. in a Bible passage. It may not be the only thing or the main thing even, but sometimes it's inescapable. And he gave the example of the church in Pergamon that he was to preach on Mm. and the sexual immorality issue. And it turns out he's to preach on that the very week. Mm. The Church of England are making some pretty calamitous decisions Mm. uh, about that area. And and the frightening reality of that scripture that says this will make the risen Lord Jesus an enemy of his own church. I mean, it's very poignant, isn't it? And uh, you obviously... um, with your background in Anglican ministry and, mm, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 so much involvement with many people in it, you you will know much more about that than we do up here. Although, as you well, you, you know, we've uh, you know a bit of over a decade ago, very much enmeshed in oh, all of this. But it must be very hard and saddening for you, but also for many others that you will still know in parish ministries and yeah. so on it's a, it's it's desperately sad yeah. and we've we've watched you you know our brothers and sisters in scotland a decade or so ago going through this and we've watched and prayed and now it's catching up with us it mm. is dreadful i mean in the church of england we've had rogue bishops yeah. sometimes quite prominent and and way out away from the truth but they've been rogue bishops mm-hmm. we've never had both archbishops and the large majority of the bishops mm. pressing the Church of England in a direction that is clearly false teaching. I mean, it's desperately sobering. I, I applaud and, the small number of courageous bishops who've stood against it, mm. but there aren't many. 
And there is a difference, isn't there, when it's not just some individuals, mm. but it actually becomes the, the really the voice of the church because yes. it, it, you can say, well, I don't agree with that, but mm. there is a there is a, there is a corporate yes uh, um, involvement that you can't mm. easily separate yourself from, isn't there? And the, and there's there's a peculiar tragedy when a national church. I mean, as mm. as you've heard in Scotland, when a national church does something of this mm. kind, because you go around. You know, similar in Scotland, really. In in cities and large towns, it's not such a big deal because there'll be other places where there's a faithful gospel being mm -hmm. preached. But you go into villages and often yeah. there's, there's nothing it's else. The church. There's the parish church. Yeah. And yeah. if the parish church loses the gospel, it's desperately sad and serious. It really is. And, of course, um, I mean, the, the Church of England is, is much bigger than the, the church in Scotland, I suppose, but, but England's a much bigger country. But... Mm -hmm. There's huge variety, mm. city, rural, uh, all the rest of it. Um, obviously, it's very sad. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, I suppose the questions, though, have to ultimately become, well, what's going to happen? Yes. What are people going to do? What are churches going to do? Yeah. What what are, what are large groups? Yeah. Do you have any sort of it's, sense of that? It's really difficult. So there's another synod, general synod, just coming up in early July, mm -hmm. and the bishops are offering those who don't agree with this, um, as far as I can see, they're going to offer us delegated um, ways of differing. In other words, it would need the permission of a diocesan bishop to come under other oversight. And that is not acceptable mm -hmm. um, for something like this, for all sorts of good reasons. The Church of England Evangelical Council is giving a um, a really, really good lead, actually, for those who want to hold to orthodoxy on this question. And that's quite a that's quite a broad. It is. I, I I was invited in January to their residential conference. I'm not a member of the council, but I was invited to go in as a guest and do one of their Bible expositions. Yes, it has some um, complementarians, egalitarians, charismatics of various sorts. It's quite a broad coalition in a way. Mm -hmm. But clearly united that sex is between a man and a woman in marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's one of their sort of bottom line things, that they're, they're all agreed on that. And it was, it was rather, it was, you know, it was really quite heartening to see that kind of unity. And they're making a good stand. How is it going to work out? Do they have, do I, they, I mean, know. what actual clout do they have? They have none. Mm -hmm. They have none. It's just they're, they're a rallying point for those who want to stand up for orthodoxy. And churches like St Andrew the Great in Cambridge, where we belonged until recently, making a clear stand, distancing themselves from these false teaching bishops. But what, is, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, it, it means they're not giving money to be used in a vague sense. I mean, they are giving money, but targeting it at those where mm -hmm. the gospel will be preached. They're not having these bishops to come and do ordinations and things. But mm -hmm. the difficulty is that the bishops actually hold all the cards. Mm -hmm. You know, the way the church polity works, mm -hmm. the bishops, you, you, you can't... Well, when a senior minister retires or dies or moves... You can't put in a new one without the diocesan bishop licensing them. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. And ordinations can't happen without the diocesan bishop. Um, they might delegate it to somebody else, but that's their choice. So it's really serious, and I don't know how it's going to work. It, it, it's, I mean, it's very, very serious. And you think, well, what's going to happen to All Souls Langham Place, which is making a clear stand for orthodoxy? Mm -hmm. So nobody has any idea how it's going to work out, but, but we know that it's very serious. Mm. You mentioned that you, you're no longer in St. Andrew Great. You, you've, you, you, you've moved to another church. Which we have. Is, not in the Church of England. Yes, we've moved to Cambridge Presbyterian Church, and we're very, very happy there. We didn't move in protest. It was, it was for personal reasons, needing to find a smaller mm. church. But it's a lovely fellowship, and we love it. Um, I, I suppose it's fair to say that we're not heartbroken 
not to be quite in the thick of the Church, Church of, England of England at the moment. Yeah. Now, I used to sometimes preach there when Ian Hamilton was a minister there, who I knew well, and, and when I was in London, sometimes used to go up and uh, and preach there, which I enjoyed. Um, but uh, so, well, I suppose, yes, I can totally understand it. It must be quite nice in a way to be at least a little bit personal. But we situated. feel, well, of course we you feel, do. and yeah. we want to support. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, in Cambridge Presbyterian Church, we pray for faithful yeah. Orthodox Anglicans who are standing for the truth. And I think it is, it's naive to think that um, just because you're not in the Anglican Church, just as people who, you know, in Scotland, who were not in the Church of Scotland, but it doesn't really affect us. Yeah. I mean, what happens in the National Church affects you whether you're in it or not. I mean, oh, it's just, it really and, does. And what happens in the Church of England yeah. it, it has a huge effect, uh, even I, on us in Scotland, because, yes. you know, it's, it's uh, well, thankfully to me, and anyway, we are still a United Kingdom, but the fact is that the, the influence of the, of the yes. Church of England is, is, and, is and The Church of England has, is, is a sort of protect, or has been a protection barrier in a sense. Yeah. Um, but when the National Church mm -hmm. keels over... Um, it is. Yes, it has huge implications for Baptists, Presbyterians, Independent, all sorts. I do. I mean, it's it's interesting for us uh, in a way looking at things sort of twelve to fifteen years on, because I suppose, yeah, it's it's fifteen years ago really uh, this year that our yeah. big uh, general assembly, where it all completely blew up, happened. It took a few years beyond that. Um, we. I finally had to leave in 2011 and mm. were thrown out of our building in 2012. Mm. So that's, you know, 12, mm. 12 plus years ago now. It's interesting looking back. I, 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 quite a lot of folks from different parts of the world actually have come and seen us and asked about our experience then, yeah. you know, from Canada as far as field as New Zealand. I mean, other yeah. Anglicans and, and, and folk in other denominations. What struck me as interesting... Um, is that our experience really was was so similar to folks in Canada yes. in the Anglican Church, which obviously happened. That was what yeah. that was the first one in the yeah. uh, Anglican Communion. We actually went and spent some time with David Short in Vancouver, mm -hmm. literally a month before that 2009 mm -hmm. uh, general general. Well, the 2011 General Assembly it was, and to hear the language that they use the, the, their whole experience I mean it was almost a carbon copy even mm. though the church polity is slightly different mm. the situation is slightly different the issues and even some of the catchphrases were exactly the same yes. and it just it was helpful to realise this is not a little small denominational problem yeah. there were people I think in, in Scotland who thought oh, you know, this is evangelicals haven't handled things properly as well as they could have done in the yeah. Church of Scotland. That's why this has come. Yes. But but you go to Canada, you hear about America, you hear about New Zealand, Australia, you realise this is nothing to do with no. parochial no. evangelicals getting things wrong. This is a this is a global, or at least a Western world yes. issue yes. of lurching away from so looking, Christianity. Looking back, Willie, what would be the main sort of things you'd want those of us in England to bear in mind as we walk through similar struggles? Yeah, I think I think probably the most important thing I would say is um, fear not, <laughs> because uh, there was an enormous... When, when you're... People from different church backgrounds don't understand this. People who've been in independent church all their life don't understand it. But when you've been in a big denominational structure or something like that, there is a great deal of fear and there's a lot of fear engendered in you about yes. the big bad world if you leave this, you know, leaving the mothership, it's, you're going to be yes. adrift on your own and all of that. And, I mean, I think, honestly, we felt that. Um, and certainly we were made to feel that. Yeah. Um, and I, re I remember quite distinctly one of the, the you know, high hegens of the, uh, of the Church of Scotland, you know, giving that warning, you know, yeah. it's a tough world out there and, you, you know, you're all going to sink. Um, and when you're in the battle and when things are tough, you know, those, those are the things that stick in your mind. Yes. Um, it wasn't true. Yeah. We look back and the churches that left with us um, and there weren't that many, but 20-something or, or whatever churches more or less in their entirety or yeah. a fair part of them. And they're all doing well. 
yeah. and all the ones I know have grown. By contrast, I'm afraid it's not the same for those that I know of that stayed in in order yes. to protect their churches. Yes, yes. Actually, the opposite has happened. So don't fear. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not to be treated lightly. And I think, you know, we if we were... Other p people also misunderstood what we were doing, I think, thinking we were uh, on the quest for the perfect church. Yeah. Um, it, if that was our me mentality, we'd never have been in the church we to begin with. Yes. <laughs> so we were not sectarian and purists in that sense uh, yeah. and unrealism. We, we were very, very reluctant, non-schismatic yes. leavers. Yes. <laughs> That's the truth. Um so it was very, it was reluctant, it was hard, it was difficult. Um, but tell me a little bit about this, what I suppose we might call friendly fire. I mean, I, I, because yeah. it's a big thing for us yeah. in England. People are make people will make different, yeah. people of orthodox convictions yeah. will make different choices. Different yeah. choices. Yeah. I think we, we tried for quite a long time with various things to unite evangelicals who could stand together. Yeah. And I think to a large extent we did stand together, but what we thought we might be able to do is all move together. Yes. And that proved to be illusory. Yeah. And I think we came to the point where we realised we can't do that and yeah. different people are going to do different things. I think we'll probably find the same yeah. thing. Yeah, and I think the, dan the real danger there is that those who have all stood together end up falling out with each other. Yes. And I think we have, I think to a large extent we avoided that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, different, some, some churches remained independent, some joined other denominations, yeah. some kind of, well, we formed with some others uh, a little presbytery of our own. Yeah. So there was different things. And I don't think that, I don't actually think that was a failure because I think um, it was, <laughs> it, it was just seeing that, different places are different and some people if they had existing strong relationships with others in another denomination and in their area that made a perfectly sensible thing to yes. do um and and others made different choices and i think i think by and large we, we we've we've um maintained good relations yeah. uh among those who stood together i think what we find most difficult though was you might call it friendly fire it felt quite unfriendly actually at the time was from from other evangelicals who who, who couldn't accept that, that we were leaving and yeah. and and were and were in the end it felt to us like brothers who stood with us on the gospel some not all some stood with the institution yeah, yeah. against us and it, and 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 it really did seem as though when push came to shove Actually, it was a sort of institutional idolatry. Yes, I know yes. that might sound offensive to some, but it, but mm. I do think the love of the institution over mm. you know if if you can side with gospel hating people, yes, for the national institution Something's against gone. gospel loving people, yeah. I, I I find yes, I think yes. that was the thing we found very difficult. So yes. my plea would be. <laughs> So those of you in the Church of England, if there are some of you who feel we must stay forever for the sake of the gospel and other, other yeah. sorts of things, please don't don't turn against those who feel they cannot do that. Yes. Because, because yes. I think that would be the real tragedy. And yes. I, I would say, sadly, there are ruptured relationships there, which yes. which we find difficult. When you have people who you've sat in an evangelical conference with for many yeah. years, named on court papers, taking you to court, that's... It's very hard to sort of, it's, well, for me, it became very hard to go back to a conference like that yes. <laughs> where yes. you could sort of pretend that that didn't really happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that would be what I'd be wanting to say. Yes. Don't, don't let that happen. And, yes. and we, our situation, we did what we felt we had to do. Yeah. I hope we, we tried very hard not to say to anybody else, you must do what we're doing. Yes. But I think we did hope that people would at least respect what we were doing. Yes. Um, yes. So that would be my plea. And I think it's almost inevitable that people, you'll find people
people who have all been together in the same conferences now in four or five different situations. And you need to think, well, how how are we going to do that? Yes, yes. And, and is there and some way the, that you can maintain keep together relation, and maintain these that friendship? relationships yep. and friendships and keep meeting up? But, you know, there are... It's it's very difficult. People are in, some people are in very difficult situations, and if you're in a if you're in a church where your congregation and your leaders are not clear on these things, and you've only been there a little while, oh, and there are plenty of those in England. Yeah, and 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 you think, well, what can I do? My only option is to leave the congregation. Yes, now, and some people felt, well, I don't want to abandon my sheep. Yeah, and I totally understand that. Yes. I mean, we'd all feel that it's a very very difficult thing. And I don't know exactly what I would have done in that situation. Yeah. But what I can say is that in some and not a few cases, folk have stayed on to protect their sheep. But mm. five, six, seven, eight, nine years, ten years later, they've then retired. Yes. And then the congregation is scattered or yes. it's closed down. or something. Yes. So actually they've protected the kingdom in my time, sort of peace well, in the kingdom in my yes, time. Yes, and I may be wrong, but I just think it's vital to do to to to, to be orthodox and upright, and that the sometimes the kindest thing we can do for those entrusted to our charge is is to leave. Some people would think I was wrong about that, but I think sometimes that may be because then they say, "Oh, this really does matter." Yeah. Oh, this is really serious. Um, you know, I, th I think, that, well, the sad fact of the matter is that in the Church of Scotland, in the decades since we left, more than a third of the entire membership of the Church of Scotland has disappeared. Mm. The Church of Scotland, in a recent article, I think it was in the Sunday Times, was said to be the biggest property agent in Scotland. Got more mm. property for sale than any other estate agent. If you yes. go on their legal yes. site, you'll see scores into mm. the hundreds of church buildings, mm. manses, mm. all being flogged off. I mean, there is a decimation happening. Mm. Mm. And that's just the reality. And so when when things have got to a certain stage, you, you in your place can't hold it up on your own because once you're gone, you have no power anymore. And also we, we, we get very obsessed with buildings Mm -hmm. Because we we think to ourselves, well, this building is a vital part of gospel ministry. And it's not a light thing to lose your building, as you know. Mm. But it's not the end of the world. No. And if you lose your building, even if you end up in house church land where you have no building, and you're mm. ex it wouldn't take much for us all to be excluded from yeah. schools and community halls. Mm -hmm. it, did. it could happen very quickly. And if we were in house church land, well, we're in house church land. Mm -hmm. um, but we must do the right thing. I think that's right. I mean, our experience was that, that uh, the Lord provided. Mm. We, we lost a very prominent building. Yes. We spent an awful lot of money on it. Yes, yes. Uh, well, the was... church we were in, St Andrew the Great, similar. Yeah. Although the likelihood of finding another one is um, very small. <laughs> and and those are those are real issues. And actually, I do think, in one way, <laughs> buildings are becoming more important again. Just because, as you say, I think churches are going to be frozen out of a lot of certainly public buildings. Because yes, of I'm a, I'm on, a on trustee of a little trust, and our, our vision is really to provide, to buy if we can, buildings yeah. either to house gospel workers or, or churches. Yeah. So I think they are becoming important, and that can mean mm. that you look at it and think, well, we mustn't lose it. But I, I think I think you're right. I think we have mm. to trust God on that. Mm. The, the Lord has provided for us. It's not been easy, but 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 he has. And I think I think he will provide. And yes. uh, you know, he, he he knows, doesn't he? Mm. Um but yeah, it's it's it, these are these are tough things and not mm. to be not to be taken lightly. I mean it was and it's costly, and it's costly not just for congregations, but particularly for those in leadership. I mean, I remember you saying to me how costly it's been for many yeah. ministers. I the, count the... myself very fortunate. I mean, I think I was very, I came quite close to health breakdown, yeah. but I avoided it. Mm. 
but I would say probably at least half of those mm. of my ministry colleagues elsewhere who went through this mm. have suffered very greatly in, mm. in, in, in their health, physical and, and yes. mental. Um, so it's not by any means to be taken lightly. Mm. It's, it's deadly serious. Mm. And I think you have to be realistic about that. What, what, what we found was that the congregation moved on incredibly quickly. Yes. Um, I was I was staggered actually how little the loss of the building mm -hmm. uh, stuck with people and I mean we we you know we had the most prominent building in the city centre of Glasgow you can't come into the town without seeing our old building and I, I just thought this is going to be terrible for people all of the time every time you see it it's going to be pangs of grief and it was astonishing it was like the Lord just took that away there were perhaps a tiny handful of people who for a time found it difficult but honestly it was it was quite extraordinary. Mm. And I found that for myself. I just I just find I had no feelings for it yes, anymore. Yes. And you know, when you've gone through a, any pastor who's gone through a building project, you know, you 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 know every intimate detail of that. And it is it's, 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 <laughs> I was astonished at that. But those of our leaders who'd been at the thick of it, you know, the seven or eight folk who'd been round the table endlessly at long meetings agonizing, it, yeah. it took a toll on them. Yes. And, you know, it, it took me a long time to, it, it, it probably, it, it took me a year or two to really get past the exhaustion of it. So yes. you've got to be and realistic about that. Probably a word for those belonging to faithful churches or perhaps in England, belonging to churches where the minister's faithful and if they're faithful people, that actually their support for their minister is really important. Well, it, it, it is really important and because they, they've got to lead you through, mm. through this. Mm. But that means they've got to be the one who is kind of standing at the front getting getting the firing. Yes. Uh, and so what yes. they can't do is if they're getting arrows in their back as well. That's right. You and I think it, I think it means that, you know, if you've got a faithful minister and sometimes you'll find yourself disagreeing that he's, he's doing something and you know, thinking, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. But unless it's a matter of conscience, support him. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, we, we pray regularly for, uh, for brethren in the, in the Church of England. Oh, thank and, you. Um, we don't, it's, uh, well, I, I, I can't fathom the machinations of the procedures and practices and the synods and meetings. There always seems to be another critical one in a month's time where the real thing is going to happen. And I can never quite work out when, <laughs> when um, they seem even better at fudging things and, 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 and put it, putting things off than they were in the Church of Scotland. But Oh, we are masters at fudging things. <laughs> And things get put off. So the last thing, the last thing I've just read about the next synod is this is going to be a three-year process of discernment, and and we actually it's it's a recipe for creep. So that yeah. de facto, um, false teaching comes in. Yeah, yeah, and and you look back. We can look back and things that came in. They said no, no, it's none of this will be compulsory. There'll be opt outs. Blah, yes, blah, blah. Uh, we have all that. And then a few years later, it's oh no, no, we've made that decision. Then there's no opt outs. Yes. So I mean, you you. One of the things I found was that even among some of our elders, they, they couldn't. They 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 thought I was. They they thought what I was saying about the way. The church structures did things was was exaggerating. They yeah. they thought I was painting them in a bad light. When they themselves actually had exposure by coming to a presbytery meeting or at some of the meetings yeah. where some of them came to our congregation, their eyes were opened, mm. and you know some were saying to me, "Why were we ever in this in the first place?" Yes, yes, um, and and I think you know it's a it's a shock to people yes. to think that what you're dealing with is often is blatant, devilish behaviour. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, that sounds a terrible thing. Until you no, open the Bible true. and, you know, in the place of justice, even there is injustice. Mm. In the place of holiness, mm. even there is wickedness. And actually that is, that's the truth. Yes, and yes, yes. You're not all part of the same thing, just having different perspectives. I mean, think, think of Jesus and his encounter, you are of your father, the devil. Well, I was reading just this morning in Luke's gospel, it was by a Presbyterian that Jesus was condemned. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that's not a, an anti-Presbyterian comment, yeah. but just it's just <laughs> an observation that it's you know somebody once one historian pointed out a sermon was preached at the burning of Archbishop Cranmer. Yeah. So yeah. it's not it's not a new thing. No, and no particular church polity is the answer. No particular. So church you know, I was reading something recently yes. by a by 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 somebody I know. It was a good article speaking about how really the answer for folks in England is not independency or uh, the Church of England, but the obvious answer is Presbyterianism. It gives you all the best things and, uh, and all the rest of it. And um, I thought, well, a lot of what he's saying is true, except that the Church of Scotland was Presbyterian. And that didn't do us much good. So <laughs> it's not, you know, that you, it's, you, the system itself doesn't save you. Yes, You've got to have yes. godly people. But I've been greatly, I've often, because I, I tend to be a bit, depressive and I sort of think oh this is awful and I've often reminded myself that on the last day the Lord Jesus will raise up every man woman and child the father has given him and nothing's going to change that yeah no so we must so fear not that's what I would say and there is hope and um, and if you find if you find yourself ejected and out and despised and all of the Uh all the rest of it you know there is life and hope and great joy beyond that and and not to be spending a vast amount of your time fighting institutional battles yeah. is a wonderful thing. Yes. And to be able to, to you know, devote yourself to the things that really matter is and a great release. And that sense of caring for one another, supporting one, thinking essentially I'm on the same side as him. There's lots of things I might disagree with him about. Yeah. But essentially we are on the same side and I'm never going to forget that. Yeah. Don't let institutions or different things break the bonds of real fellowship. Yes. I, th- I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. But look, we've talked a lot about kind of, um, this all came from lamentations, but there's not just lamentations, there's great joy. And one of the things that I think is 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 a, a great blessing of your uh, the, the, your position now is that you, you get invited to all sorts of places to speak, not just in this yes. country, but in other parts of the world. And um, I think you'd said you'd been in Singapore recently and Sweden and yeah. other places. Yeah. And, and lots of encouraging things. It's a great joy. So Sweden, I was in Sweden with, with Carolyn, my wife, in March. And it was a, a small Bible conference. It's been running about six or seven years. Not a big thing in Gothenburg. But uh, there were about 150 there, mostly young in their 20s and 30s. That's and, terrific. And they said to us, you know, when a society becomes so deeply secular... Young people grow up knowing that they're starving. Mm. There's nothing for their souls. And, and maybe Sweden this and a is... lot of Scandinavia, yeah. very, very much so. Really? Yeah. Yes, yes. So that was encouraging. And then mm. I was in Singapore recently for a... It was actually a Brethren church where they took 760 people away for a church camp. Wow. From Thursday to Sunday. They took them all to Kuala Lumpur from right? Singapore. Gosh. But they were mostly the 20s and 30s. Loads of these young Singaporean men and women wow. eager to follow Jesus, hungry for the scriptures. It was just hugely encouraging. So the Lord has got his people all over the world, hasn't he? And yes. and and you know, we're so Western centric. Yeah. And even well, we're just so self parochial, really, aren't we? Yes. But but you know, the 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 Lord is building his church all over the world. And if the if the momentum of the spirit is moving in other parts of the world yeah. and great things are happening you know that, that we can find joy in that too can't we oh we can and we just it humbles us because we're used to feeling we're the center of the universe and we're <laughs> the place that matters and it takes us a few years to wake yeah. up to the fact that we're not <laughs> yeah i used to find this at cornhill in london that the those who came on bursaries from especially from sub-saharan africa and mm-hmm. parts of asia um I just thought I learned so much from their faith and their courage. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think I learned far more from them than they ever might have learned from me or from us. Yeah. I, as you know, I go to India most years and uh, yes. I won't say where or to who just because we and because things are getting very difficult there. Yeah. Although I certainly am rejoicing that Mr Modi lost his majority in, yeah. the, in the recent elections and I'm hoping mm. that will ease things a little mm. bit for, for believers. But... Yeah, I I come back every time deeply humbled, uh, yes. meeting people who have very very little, but yeah. who I just have wonderful faithful ministries for the Lord, yes. and on fire for yes. the Lord, and yes. are facing real p- persecution, yes. real struggles and hardship. I mean, yeah. I yeah. 
I went back this year, not thinking I was going to go, but the previous year at the end of the conference, uh, people were asked from the front, you know, how, how many of you have been beaten or arrested uh, or put in prison over this last year because of your ministry? I was sitting in the front row and thought, gosh, I wonder if anybody has. I turned around and more than half of the people put their hands up. That's and I was, very sobering, isn't I it? Was so, I was so moved by that. Yes. I just thought, you know... I complain about having a long flight and a bit of discomfort and all yes. the rest of it for a few days. I think I won't come next year. Shame on you. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I yes. went home and got a ticket for next year because I just thought, well, that's, you know, and that's, that tells you, doesn't it? And yet what a wonderful encouragement because you go back next year and these guys all come again. Yes. And, yes. you know, yes. amidst a lot, a lot of difficulty. So the Lord, the Lord is not, cowed by these sorts of things no, no. Maybe... and it's a lovely thing at Tyndale House in Cambridge it's lovely because we get various from all pastors over. from all over the world sometimes from pretty tough areas yeah. we had one from Russia just when the war he had to go home early when the war started mm -hmm. in Ukraine mm -hmm. faithful reformed pastor it's mm. just very humbling but it's also yeah. very encouraging you, you think yeah, the Lord is. has his people yeah, and they're showing faith and courage and perseverance Krista, we want you to show faith and courage and perseverance in keeping writing books, which we all need and, uh, and love. So <laughs> we will pray for that. Thank uh, you. I do pray for that. What else can we pray particularly for you in, uh, in the next little while? What are you um, I think in? Um, wisdom to know what, where to go and what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just as I get older, energy levels in God's kindness, I'm still in good health, but... Um, mm -hmm. It, it just, you know, I can't do what I you could do wise, 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And just wisdom to know where to spend my time and the energy that God gives me. Mm -hmm. And and also, to some extent, what to do in terms of the mixture of time devoted to writing and time devoted to speaking or mm -hmm. preaching. And actually, just for godliness, I was sharing with my prayer. I pray with two other younger men at Tyndale House and I was sharing about some of the temptations that I still have when I'm 70 and they were discouraged really these were things about sort of you know looking wrongly at a young woman and things and one of my prayer partners who's 42 he said oh I thought after the age of 42 it was all fine <laughs> he said it was it was both discouraging but encouraging That's that, what we all that I was still thinking. fighting the battle yeah and actually yeah. just to pray for godliness yeah, that's what that's that's what we all need, isn't it? Too, isn't it that uh, we need to we need to keep on fighting the battles and yeah. uh, and, and giving a lead to others. Now, brother, we will pray for you. We're we're so grateful to you for coming, and very grateful for this chance to have a chat and catch up and uh, chew very, the fat over a number of things. Very grateful to have been invited. And, it's been a joy. Uh, you're off on holiday to Harris, I think. We after are. The conference. Yes, I'm preaching so, at a free church. In Harris, God willing, on Sunday, which will be a new experience for me. Uh, and their evening service, I'm not preaching because it's in Gaelic. Oh, well, you'll be able to, uh, you may need an interpreter however, we're, for we're, that. We're, go we're going to go. <laughs> Unless there's a new Pentecost, I won't understand. Well, we shall pray that uh, you'll have a, a good time of rest. And, Thank you. Uh, may the Western Isles weather even be kind to you. We could do, we, we wouldn't mind a bit of it being kind to us here too. <laughs> Feels like the middle of winter. Yes. <laughs> anyway, thank you thank so you. much for the time to chat and uh, thank you for coming and uh, may the Lord bless you in your ongoing ministry. Thanks so much, Willie. You thank too. Thank you.